Hey, Ronnie Dale, for wheeling in westernaustralia.com and welcome to a proper real life review on the 79 series dual cab GXL. This isn't some review where someone's taken a vehicle out for one day, this is four years. This is over 110,000 kilometers on the clock in this vehicle. It has been off road for half of its life or half of those Ks and the rest of the Ks has been to and from city driving, all kinds of driving. So in this video, I'm going to provide you with pretty much everything about the vehicle so you can decide if this is the vehicle for you. And if you already have one, you may even pick up a few pointers of things you may need to change and things you don't really need to change. So stay tuned. So here is a list of things I'm going to cover in this review on the vehicle. And as you can see, it's fairly extensive. There's a lot of points I'm going to cover. So if you want to jump to any of those, just go down into the, the description below and it's all timestamped. What do you actually get with this vehicle? Well, this vehicle was in fact designed for the mines and for agricultural needs and has ended up being one of the most popular sought out or sought after vehicles for a four wheel drive platform. So a platform to build a big tourer or an expedition vehicle with. I mean, these are perfect for it. And why are they perfect for it? Well, it's the only vehicle that I know of at the moment that comes out with a V8 turbo diesel. So it can tow, it's got a really good torque curve. It's, it's a really strong motor with front and rear solid axles. So it's robust and you get front and rear lockers, GXL version of course. There are some flaws of course, some are actually beneficial. For example, Toyota always underpower their motors to keep reliability. That's what I've found anyway. There is so much power you can unlock out of this engine. Even if you just unlock a little bit like I've done, I haven't gone overboard because you want to keep the reliability. This will help you with heavy loads and if you're towing heavy loads as well. Although it can tow it fine without any engine modifications. It's actually, you can get away with not even modifying the engine. But there are some things that need attention in there and I'll get to those later on. Now the other thing that's kind of beneficial but not good as it is stock and that is the gearing. Now the gearing in this vehicle is really undergeared. If you don't upgrade the tires on it, your RPM is sitting on 2,700 RPM down the highway, way too high in my opinion. You're just burning fuel. With the small modification of putting on 33 inch tires, it will actually put your revs back and you actually, in some cases, save fuel. And if you really want to go to 35s, you can do so and you don't even have to re-gear the differentials because it is so low geared, it works perfectly. Flaws with this vehicle that should really be changed and that is the rear axle is narrower than the front and the reason for that is when they put in the V8, they expanded the axle on the front and they didn't do the rear. Don't know why, they haven't changed it and even on the latest 2017 model, they haven't sorted that out. So. For the, the amount of money you pay for this vehicle, that should really be sorted out. Right, comfort. Ugh. First, let's talk about space. This seat is as far back as it can get. I'm six foot one, and I'm just, just comfortable enough. Now, you do end up with a bit of bad posture, I find, because if I'm sitting up straight, top third of my vision is actually cut off by the roof here which is kind of annoying so as you're driving you're trying to keep a straight back you kind of end up slumping down a bit and you end up like this because then you got the full vin window for vision bit of an issue this seat to start with this seat was great now after four years and 115,000 kilometers it's uh it's really crap i really want to change it the uh, interior is very basic. You get bugger all storage. So I have added the roof console to have some things up there. Um, yeah, it is very, very basic on the inside. Comfort wise when you're driving, I mean, that's all to do with the chair really. Corrugations, it handles it well. Get the right tire pressure, of course. As a passenger, in the back, 
it's not enough room. My knees are touching here. I feel like my head's going to touch the ceiling and I have to bend down and look out the window. That said though, for kids, this is probably the best back seat that I've seen so far in any vehicle for kids. They sit at a nice height, they get a great view through the front and through the sides. Previous vehicles I've had, kids can't see through the front window and they've got this tiny window that they can look out out the side. So in terms of kids in the back, perfect. Adults in the back, Bit of an off-road review now with this 79 series Land Cruiser. They are so much fun off-road. Especially if you put that exhaust on the back of these. Just roaring up those sand dunes. Roaring up a muddy hill. really fun vehicle but there are some flaws one of those flaws when it comes to off-roading are those leaf packs in the back they are so low they sit as low as the actual diff pumpkin so as you're driving up through rutted country and you're sitting in the ruts that is what hinders you sometimes you have to rely on a v8 to pull you out which half the time doesn't really work if there's rocks about because you get stuck on those leaf packs as you may have seen in most of my videos already, you could pretty much throw any track at a 79 series dual cab GXL Land Cruiser with lockers of course, and it will eat the track up, it will do it. Maybe not with the same ease as a Jeep Wrangler on those technical tracks or a GQ Patrol or a Land Rover Defender because they have superior flex, because let's face it, a 79 series Land Cruiser has zero flex compared to those vehicles. You can improve it by parabolic suspension though. My cruiser now has pretty good flex, but with the leaf pack, zero flex pretty much relying on lockers. But that said, it will do those tracks and it will go very remote and stay very reliable and carry big loads. So overall, a 79 series Land Cruiser dual cab GXL is a real off-road machine. Finally, for the off-roading part, we'll talk about the angles on the vehicle. Approach angle, ramp over angle, and departure angle. Now, I have a video explaining what I'm talking about here, if you're not sure. Right, so, departure angle. You're coming out of a deep gully or a creek or whatever. The departure angle on these is not that great, especially if you have the stock 1.8 meter Toyota tray on it you will collect on the bottom. I've actually shortened mine. The ramp over angle, you have to keep this in mind. This is a really long wheelbase and that's why the turning circle is not that great. Plus, they don't allow much turning on the front either. The ramp over angle is quite big, so keep that in mind when going over humps. You have to take them on slight angles, otherwise you may damage your tail shaft underneath. I have replaced one of those. The approach angle, that's all gonna depend on what bar work you put on the front. Different bull bars have different approach angles. So here is a damage report of things I've broken on the vehicle. Alternator, wheel bearings on the rear, I've bent a drive shaft, I've bent a diff housing, the rear one, so I had to upgrade that, well, I'll get to the fixes. Uh, a CV was replaced, turns out it was okay, but I replaced it anyway. And I've, I snapped an axle towing a camper trailer. That was on the driver's side rear. My driver's side window, if I wind the window all the way down and I slam the door, it jumps out of its track. Now, it's not just me that's had this problem. A few other people have had that issue as well. Now, I'm out of warranty and um, I should have taken it there while I was under warranty. So that is my own stupid fault. Now, I just put up with it. It's pretty quick to fix, but it's a pain in the ass, right? Now, the other thing that every Toyota owner can relate to is the handbrake. There is no Toyota handbrake. Toyota handbrakes, may as well not even put a handbrake in this vehicle. It does nothing. 
I think the handbrake's on now. Oh, I can actually push the vehicle with the handbrake all the way up. Now, if I wasn't parked on sand, I'd have to leave it in gear. That's how bad my handbrake is now. And the problem is, if you do tighten your handbrake, you can get maybe a week out of it if you're off-roading. The minute you get any dirt in there, it is completely out of calibration again. It, it's, handbrakes are no good. So we're now onto things that I had to change. I felt forced to change on this vehicle to help keep it reliable out in the middle of nowhere, even though it is a reliable vehicle. There are some things on it that are not reliable and those I'll get to right now. We'll start with the actual air intake. So here I've added a snorkel because the standard Toyota raised air intake, so it's not a snorkel, a raised air intake, is actually in five pieces. So go through a water crossing, you're going to suck in water. Well, very highly likely that's going to happen. So I change it to a one piece safari snorkel. Uh, the other thing that I had to change was in fact the alternator, which I spoke about before, which was an issue. Now the standard alternator on these vehicles is going to die at some point. It's just a matter of time. What I have replaced it with is a water-cooled alternator. So it's 100% sealed, taps into the heating system and relies on coolant. So now there is no chance of me being stranded out in the middle of nowhere because I have an alternator full of mud. The next thing I had to change was the wheel track. I had to correct it. So initially I had negative 55 offset rim on the rear, a zero offset on the front, but now zero rear, zero front, so zero offset all around because I have replaced the axle, because I bent the axle, right? So now I've replaced it with a J-Max leaf kit. So it's a bolt-in job, and now everything lines up just as it did before with a negative 55. So there's a cheaper and, and an expensive way of doing it. But it needs to be sorted, in my opinion. Fuel economy. So if you hit up the uh, Toyota website, it'll say 11 liters per 100. And we all know that that is kind of BS. Even this vehicle, as I had it when I was stock, I wasn't getting 11, I was getting more like 13s. And on the highway, I was, it was really drinking. So now with all the modifications on it, because this is what we're talking about, we are reviewing this vehicle if you want to do what I'm doing in the vehicle. 33s, 35s, inch tires, bar work, all the weights, roof rack, you name it, it's all on there. As my car sits right now, I can still get 13.8.9 around city driving. Okay, so about high 13 to mid 14, I can actually get, which is pretty good considering all the stuff that's on it. But as soon as I hit the highway and I'm going 100, then I'm looking at about 15 to 16 liters per 100. If I go 110 fully loaded, you're looking at 16, 17 liters per 100. And that, that is with a lot of weight on it. And as soon as you go 110, I mean, these vehicles are shaped like a brick. You add all the weight to it, it really does chew the fuel. Towing a camper trailer that's not a wind resistance impact on the vehicle because it's sitting behind, then in actual fact, you don't see much difference in your fuel. It may be half an extra liter per 100 with a trailer that's about a ton and a half so when these tow they're actually really really good for towing you tow a caravan things are going to change i really need to know a couple of things here that are necessary oh someone has to tend to their intercooler i think clean that up all right there are two things that you really need to do to this motor one is get a secondary fuel filter over here and then get a catch can, okay? That'll stop the vapor from re-entering everything and uh, you know just clogging things up. So fuel filter, catch can. Ah, one more thing, sorry. Diff breathers. On these vehicles, the GXL, we have the lockers. You have a diff breather in the locker and you have a diff breather from the actual axle or the diff pumpkin itself. So there are four diff breathers just from your axles. 
And then you have one breather, only one, from your transfer case and gearbox. They're, they're joined together. They share the same breather. So those things are something you must address with this vehicle. Now obviously you'll be looking at these second hand if it already has a catch can and a fuel filter, you know that it has been looked after. And just check those breathers as well. And look, if you can see a lot of dirt in it, like it's been through a lot of mud and it doesn't have breathers, make sure the lockers actually work before you purchase the vehicle because they can suffer from mud ingest if they don't have breathers. Just something to keep in mind. Apart from that though, these motors are really good. Really, really good. And the airbox seals really well too. Pros and cons, and just real quick dot points here. We'll start with the pros. One of the last vehicles to be released with solid front and rear axles. Twin locked front and rear. 33 inch tires fit from stock and is geared for it, and 35 inch tires are not that hard to fit. A Torquey V8 turbo diesel, very easy to modify. Every accessory known to mankind under the sun is available for this vehicle. And my final pro, the rear tray. Endless options. You can do anything you like with it. Of course, you need to spend some money to do that, but you have endless options. As opposed to a wagon, you're kind of stuck to a certain style of fit out. Cons, and there are a lot of cons here actually. So if you get this vehicle as stock, all you get really is a 1980s, 1990s technology. Aside from the motor. Look, the motor is a high-tech sophisticated engine that's quite uh, sensitive to fuel contaminants and whatnot. There is basically zero technology inside that vehicle. You need to spend a lot of money on this vehicle to get it up to a touring standard or an expedition standard. Much because of the rear tray and because of all the low-tech stuff inside. For example, the radio in there is woeful. You get two speakers in a four-door vehicle with a really crappy stereo. So there are a lot of things you need to tend to and spend money on. The rear narrow axle, it is a con. Off-roading in sand, it can be a real pain. It'll keep skipping in and out of the actual wheel ruts that the front wheels create. It has a leaf pack rear, so unload it. It's a bit of a rough ride. The cab is really noisy and really basic. The seats are not the greatest. Let's face it, if you are any taller than six foot one, you're going to struggle to fit in this vehicle. Conclusion time of this review with this vehicle. Should you buy one, should you not? That's entirely up to you, but I'm going to make my opinion noted and maybe that'll help you make a choice if you haven't already. Basically, the vehicle behind me, I purchased that in 2013 uh, with the intention of not selling it, okay? The intention of not selling it. The previous vehicle I had, had the same intention, but then my family grew, I ended up getting this thing here. So, all the mods that are on this vehicle are not money I've spent on it, they're money that I have invested into it. So if you are going to invest money into an overland vehicle that you want that is robust and can definitely get you in and get you back out, has all the gear on it, can handle the load, it's not gonna crack the chassis, that is your vehicle. If, however, you're worried about fuel bills and you're mainly hanging around the city, you don't really need a big vehicle like that, you don't head out that often, you're not going to hold a vehicle for more than five years, I would not buy that vehicle at all. If my situation was different, if I'm not gonna head out into the bush very often, I'd just get a Hilux or, or something a bit more practical, something a bit more fuel efficient, you know, maybe even like a, a D-Max or with any other dual cab vehicle that's out there. I would look at those instead. Much cheaper, cheaper to run, and you can still accessorize them, kit them out, and then you sell it and on you go. For those who do end up buying these, or who are looking at buying them, you'll probably notice that the latest version, which has a few things corrected on it, not much, but a few things corrected on it, the 2017 version, you compare that to a 2015 version that has a bit of gear on it, the price is almost the same. It is ridiculous. They hold their value so well. A cruiser with 40,000 to 50,000 kilometers on it 
are still going for about $60,000. They hold their value so well. So that is a definitely a big bonus for this vehicle. And um, look, finally, if you want a vehicle for towing, that's the vehicle for you. If you don't need to tow, head out every now and then, not for you. Waste the money, you're wasting your money. Investing, not investing, that's pretty much what I'll put it down to. So I hope you enjoyed the video. So I hope it's been helpful. If you are looking at buying a used one, here's a video right here on how to buy a used four wheel drive. Well, it's a whole series actually. And you can subscribe here. And if you'd like to support the creation of videos like this, patreon.com slash Ronnie Dale. See you in the next video.